It was May 12th. Kontum City was surrounded. The 44th Infantry Regiment was still deploying to Fire Support Base November, just northwest of the city. The 53rd were deployed to the northeast of the city, guarding the airfield. The 45th Regiment protected the center of the city. Two rough puff battalions guarded the southern approach to Kontum. Fortunately for them, the Dakhla River wrapped around the southern portion of the city, providing a natural barrier. Even then, a battalion of the 45th Regiment was deployed with them as reinforcement. The US Air Force and Vietnam Air Force steadily ramped up the number of strike sorties. They had flown 3,400 strike missions in the previous month of April, and many more were planned for May. John Paul Van diverted as many arc lights to two corps as possible, especially since I and three corps were in a lull in fighting. On May 12th alone, 25 arc lights fell on the Kondom area, along with 78 tactical strikes. South Vietnamese Ranger patrols ensured that as many communist buildups were hit as possible. Colonel Lee Tong Ba and General Nguyen Ban Tuan ensured that M72 laws were issued to all of the men defending the city. T-54 tank hulls were set up as targets so that the men could train properly. The South Vietnamese soldiers were also given pictures of other Arvin troops from Anlop and I Corps standing beside knocked out T 54s to ensure they knew that the weapons actually worked. The artillery fire on Gon Dung intensified. Howitzer rounds narrowly missed some C 130s. This forced the USAF to stop daylight C 130 missions into the city entirely. Ammunition, food, and other supplies started to be rationed. The battle was imminent. By May 13th, the People's Army of Vietnam had almost finished all preparations for the assault on Gon Dung. 29 infantry battalions, 2 armored battalions, and 13 artillery battalions were set to take the city. The North Vietnamese 320th Division would command the assault. The 2nd Pavan Division was still in refit and would remain in reserve. With the battle for Khon Dung imminent, in Mac V, secret orders were sent out, deploying a very small unit of three 82nd Airborne Jeeps equipped with tow missiles to the city. Due to its very small size, this was more so to test the new missiles as opposed to turning the tide of the battle. They flew in with the last 490 troops of the 23rd Division's 44th Regiment. Colonel Truby deployed two of the three American tow jeeps with the 44th to cover Highway 14. That evening, at 5.50 p.m., the North Vietnamese started to bombard FSB November. At 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., radio intercepts confirmed the attack for the following day, May 14th, at 4 a.m. At 10.30 p.m., the 44th Regiment reported spotting headlights coming down towards them. The tanks were moving into position. Early in the morning of May 14th, at 4 a.m., the South Vietnamese soldiers braced for impact. And nothing happened. Another intercept revealed a delay of 30 minutes while the bombardment steadily increased. Lieutenant Colonel Diu, the 23rd Division Intel officer, also pointed out that Hanoi was one hour behind, so the attack would most likely start at 5.30 a.m. Saigon time. And he was correct. At 5.30 a.m. exactly, the communist assault materialized. A large wave of infantry charged forward with 10 T-54s and engaged the entire 23rd Division defensive perimeter. The 48th Pavan Regiment, with a company of tanks, struck from the west side of Highway 14. The 64th ran in parallel from the east side of the highway with another tank company. The independent 28th Pavan Regiment struck from the north, and the 141st Regiment probed rough puff positions in the south. Allied air support was scrambled, but had not yet arrived. On order from Colonel Ba, the artillery commander focused his fire directly at the North Vietnamese on Highway 14. It had the effect of forcing the infantry back from their tanks. At this moment, one of the South Vietnamese soldiers of the 44th made the decision to climb out of his foxhole and use an M72 to destroy one of the T-54s. The news spread instantly, encouraging more soldiers to run out. A second was destroyed within minutes. 
At 6.30 a.m., Hawksclaw coal helicopters finally arrived, knocking out the remaining tanks. Even with their armor being destroyed, the Pavan infantry surged forward and employed their commonest tactic of grabbing by the belt, fighting in close quarters so that Allied artillery and airstrikes could not provide support. However, the attack stalled and the North Vietnamese could barely inch forward against the South Vietnamese perimeter. John Paul Van and General Nguyen Ban Duan took the opportunity to fly right into Gondong for lunch. Duan publicly declared that he had an award of $120 and a promotion for every soldier who destroyed a tank. They also brought the intended advisor to the 23rd Arvin Division, Colonel Rotenberry. Rotenberry would shadow Truby for the next several days before Colonel Truby was extracted from the battle. Van and Duan then flew out of the city back to 2 Corps Command in Pleiku. Throughout the day, the men of the 23rd engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting against the North Vietnamese soldiers, pushing them out and restoring the defensive perimeter by dark. Even with a failed morning assault, at 8 p.m., the 320th Pavan Division launched another major attack with a fresh complement of tanks. This time, the assault was much fiercer. A Pavan battalion broke through, wedging itself between the 44th and 53rd Arvin regiments. With the 44th under critical attack from three sides, Colonel Tran Quang Dien, the commander of the 44th Regiment, requested artillery on his own position, with the hope that his own troops would survive in their foxholes, while the communists were not in the open. It was a move of last resort for survival. Fortunately for the men of the 44th, the order was cancelled by division leadership after a specter appeared overhead to provide direct fire. As the 44th Regiment held out, the 23rd Division leadership tried to determine a way to deal with the penetration. It was concluded that an arc light was the only viable solution. Division command sent out orders for both the 44th and 53rd regiments to temporarily pull back as the arc light landed right at the penetration. With the box so close to friendly lines, special approval had to be granted. It was within the hard limit, but the situation was critical. At 4.25 a.m., the arc light fell, and the Pavan assault shattered. The 44th Regiment had barely survived. The 53rd Arvin Regiment, immediately after the strike, took the initiative to assault into the Pavan penetration and pushed them out. Colonel Li Tongba immediately ordered his troops to push outward, seizing back as much territory as possible. Each regiment reported hundreds of bodies wiped out by arc lights as they reconsolidated their positions. Seven tank holes were seen burning in the strike range. The 23rd Division had survived its first day of the Battle of Gondom. Even with the 23rd Division holding out at Gondom, during the same night, at two corps headquarters in Pleiku, North Vietnamese sappers managed to break into the city and rigged explosives to destroy a large tank of jet fuel and other aviation equipment. Additional artillery fire managed to destroy an additional 330 tons of ammunition, which was sorely needed in the Kontum resupply effort. The North Vietnamese continued to bombard Arvin positions in Kontum. At around 8 p.m. on May 15th, fire increased heavily on the 44th Regiment including direct 100mm fire from a platoon of T-54s just across Highway 14. The tow jeeps managed to take one of them out. Tow Hueys flew in and tried to destroy more, but the tanks had withdrawn. The following morning, at 6am on May 16th, the tank platoon returned to continue firing at South Vietnamese positions. One Pavan unit had managed to get in using the Dak Do Dreh stream behind the round hill at the graveyard. An assault by the 44th Regiment and one by the 53rd were unsuccessful in pushing the communists out from the graveyard. But for now, the North Vietnamese couldn't push past it either. While the ground assault stalled, North Vietnamese artillery fire continued to target the airfield. It managed to destroy two South Vietnamese C-123s, closing it temporarily. The Kontom province chief had to organize a team of civilians to start clearing out the airfield during the night. At 11.40 p.m., the Commons launched their final assault of the day against the 53rd Regiment, but were very unlucky as they walked right under an arc light strike. 
it disintegrated right before the South Vietnamese lines. On May 17th, when it was clear that the situation was secure, Colonel Rotenberry fully assumed his position as the 23rd Division's senior advisor. Colonel Truby was presented the Arbon Gallantry Cross by Colonel Ba. He was then flown out of the city to Saigon, then stateside for his new deployment. But even with the decrease in ground attacks, the bombardment continued. A C-130 pilot had made a split decision to try to take off under mortar fire, but his wing was ripped off by a building, resulting in the aircraft crashing and exploding. Only one of the crew survived. The crash also destroyed the pumping station and ammunition dump, further straining supplies. The fire and smoke could be seen from two kilometers away at Firebase November. Pavin units continued to launch probing attack. The 48th Pavin Regiment continued to send men through the Duck Dodre stream bed. Now, a reinforced battalion was present in the graveyard. Colonels Ba and Rotenberry discussed another close quarters arc light for the evening. The arc light landed, crippling the buildup without any South Vietnamese casualties. But even with the flanking unit recovering from the strike, Pavin units launched another assault on the 44th at 10 p.m. The front lines were penetrated at 5 a.m., causing Colonel Dean to request artillery on his own unit again. Fortunately, an arc light fell right on the assault just 30 minutes later, stopping the attack. The North Vietnamese forces were forced to withdraw back from its gains. For the rest of the day, the communist forces regrouped for yet another assault the following night. On May 18th, at 10 p.m. again, a large bombardment commenced on all Arvin positions in the city, coordinating with probes along the perimeter. After the barrage, the 48th Pavin Regiment, supported by six tanks, launched a new assault on the 44th Arvin Regiment. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out as Cobras and Spectres helped the South Vietnamese soldiers hold on. On the morning of the 19th, starting at 5 a.m., arc lights disintegrated the communist assault forcing them to end their attack and withdraw. Seizing the initiative, South Vietnamese probes were sent out. At 11 a.m., the recon company was air assaulted 8 kilometers north to clear Pavan artillery positions. Each of the 23rd Division's regiments sent a couple battalions north to clear out remaining Pavan positions. The airfield reopened that evening, allowing 32 C-130 flights during the following two nights. The 320th Pavan Division continued to launch small probes at Arvin Lines. In the morning of May 20th, three assaults were launched at the 53rd Regiment, causing another penetration which threatened to isolate the 44th. It was far too close to the 53rd's lines for airstrikes, so Colonel Bao was convinced by John Paul Van and General Tuan to deploy his M41 light tanks. Colonel Bao personally took command of the counterattack, and the 53rd Regiment retook its position. The following morning, North Vietnamese forces struck the exact same location, wedging itself between the 44th and 45th regiments. Simultaneously, another communist wedge was formed between the 45th and 53rd regiments. The Vietnam Air Force scrambled an AC-47 Spooky, and it arrived just in time, stopping the assault in its tracks. Two arc lights and danger close airstrikes annihilated the remaining North Vietnamese in both penetrations. Lieutenant Colonel Dean ordered a counterattack on the 44th 45th penetration, clearing it out completely. Colonel Ba, again, personally took command to destroy the wedge between the 45th and 53rd regiments and eliminated the wedge after an hour. To the south of Gontom on May 21st, Chu Corps leadership ordered the 2nd and 6th Ranger Groups to attempt to reopen the Chu Pao Pass. The 6th Ranger Group attempted to push through the pass, while two of the 2nd Ranger Group's battalions were air assaulted onto the Communist stronghold at the rock pile. M113s pushed through the pass methodically, only for RPGs to knock some of them out. They would get bogged down when much needed airstrikes were diverted to Gondom, trying to clear out the block manually would take weeks. Resupply would still have to take place in the air. On May 23rd, another C-130 crashed, 
ammunition dropped to a critical 10% for some South Vietnamese units. But it was clear by this point that the Pavan 320th Division had failed to take Gon Tom. Pavan forces launched probes nightly, but these grew weaker each time. Colonels Rotenberry and Ba made the decision to switch the positions of the 45th and 44th Regiments, allowing the 44th to recover. The move was started on May 22nd and was completed on the 24th. It would just be in time. While the 23rd Arvin Division had survived its assault by the 320th Pavan Division, the 2nd Pavan Division had finished its recovery and was now preparing to take charge of the Battle of Hontong.